sabore, ya le te llega a me rakita, me rakis y me elmisen investor Thomas conferenci, ya no aris, ya vagatore, a me uesti o la te llega. Ni alustame, ragmi investeri misest, agapalun inglis ekenes. That was brutal for you, wasn't it? That was pain. Like, I saw some of the faces, and you're like, ah, oh, make him stop. Get him out of the stage. Put him out of his misery. So I promise you, that was the most painful part of my presentation. So we are here to talk about investments, right? That's what the Investeribus Festival is all about. Unless my Estonian is so bad, I completely um, lost in translation. Um, uh, but we will talk about investments through the lens of the climate. So bear with me for a couple of minutes while we go just through the basics of global warming. And I know some of you might be experts on this subject, but some may not be as familiar, so let's make sure we all have the even level of knowledge. So let's get started. So the basics of global warming. Fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are fossils that have been under the ground for millions of years from dead plants, from dead animals, and they contain oil, they contain gas, and they contain coal. These are fossil fuels. And we burn these fossil fuels to produce the electricity in our homes, the heating in our houses, our transportation, the way we cook with stoves, they all come. They've all historically come mostly from fossil fuels, the factories that we run. When we burn these fossil fuels, we create greenhouse gases. Now, don't worry about knowing what all the different gases are. Just know carbon dioxide, because that's by far the biggest. And most people will just say greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, CO2, carbon footprint. It's essentially the same thing. Don't worry about the differences. But when we burn, these fossil fuels, we get these type of gases. And we've been burning fossil fuels quite intensively since the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. You see, before the Industrial Revolution, we did emit greenhouse gases, but we had enough nature to capture it. So our planet was in balance. So essentially, trees, the soil on the ground, our oceans, they capture carbon. But now we've been burning so much of it that nature just can't keep up. We don't have enough trees or oceans to capture them. And when we emit these gases, they go up into the atmosphere and they trap heat. And when they trap heat, that's what causes global warming. So very simple, in summary, Fossil fuels contain oil, gas, and coal. We burn them to produce a lot of the things that burn our lives, electricity, transportation, etc. They rise up into the air through greenhouse gases. They trap heat. We have global warming. So why is this a problem? I'm not going to share these negative images with you because I told you the worst part about my presentation was my Estonian. But global warming is causing major issues. They're causing forest fires. We love our forests here in Estonia, right? What a shame to have them burned down. Droughts, where land where you used to be able to grow food, you can't do that anymore. Rising water levels, causing floods, displacing cities. There could be, by the middle of this century, over one billion climate refugees. One billion because they will no longer be able to live in certain parts of the world highly affected by this. They will not be able to source crops, their food anymore. So think about the consequences of displacing one billion people by the middle of this century. Now, greenhouse gases are everywhere. They're everywhere. So this, is, this chart has a, a, a lot of information, but focus on the one on the left, just to see where these gases are coming from. So top emitters, China, US, European Union, India, 
those are kind of the big four. Two of those countries or, or economies are very developed, US and, and the EU, the others are emerging. But look at the sectors, that's the one on, the, on my right hand side. A lot of people don't know this. Electricity and heating are the biggest sources of greenhouse gases. Because two thirds of the world's electricity, two thirds of the world's electricity still comes from fossil fuels. So it's great, we're electrifying our things as much as we can and we have to. But if the source of that electricity is still fossil fuels, then we're not, we're not really solving the problem. Next up, industry and construction is another huge source of emissions. The roads that we have, the bridges that we have, the train tracks of our trains. You need cement. Cement comes from limestone. When you transform limestone into cement, emissions are released. You need steel. When you transform iron ore into steel, emissions are released. Another big one is transportation. We all know this, this is an easy one. Trucks, cars, airplanes, tankers, etc. And I'll mention one more, agriculture. That's another big one. Agriculture, because soil traps carbon. And when you overuse soil, you damage it and that carbon gets released. Our trees, we cut them down to work the land. Carbon is affected. Right? The farmers, the trucks that they use, the cotton uses fertilizer. So emissions are everywhere. And I am not here to blame anybody. I am not here to claim any moral authority. I am very far away from that. And I love a good hamburger, trust me. So I love that we have cows and, and um, uh, you know, in agriculture, cows are one of the biggest emitters. You'll laugh, but through their burps and through their farts, they actually emit a lot of greenhouse gases. So it's in our daily lives, whether we like it or not. So it's important that we acknowledge this. Now, we also have green sources of energy, renewable sources, right? Solar, wind, hydro, these are emissions free at the time of production of the energy. Those exist. But we're very far away from using it as much as we can. Because in Europe, today, 70% of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. And the top three Oil, gas, and coal. You can see solar, hydro, wind, still a tiny, tiny amount here in Europe. And Europe is way ahead of the rest of the world. So in Europe, 70% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. The rest of the world, 82. But I'm optimistic. And we can make it happen because the EU has actually already cut its emissions by a third since they peaked in the 70s and 80s. A lot of you weren't even born back then. We've already gone a third of the way. Pretty sure we can go another third and another third. Why not? We've done it before. And part of what's happening is there's literally trillions of euros, dollars, whatever the conversion, trillions going into the energy transition. Last year we had 1.2 trillion. And not only that, but the trend, it's essentially doubled since 2019, when the world was more normal before COVID. So the trend is moving in the right direction. And this will only continue because we learned an awfully hard lesson last year, that energy is not just a matter of the environment, but also national security. In Europe, we were far too dependent on Russian oil and gas. 40% of our oil and gas imports came from Russia. So now, countries in Europe and also the United States are saying for a matter of security, we need to source our energy locally. And 
If we're going to invest in new sources of energy, we'll might as well make them green, right? <laughs> so this trend will only continue. Okay, so now everybody here is an expert on climate change. Everybody here is an expert in energy. So what is a sustainable investment? Ah, the word sustainable. It's the most overused word in the English language. Everybody's sustainable. Sustainable products, sustainably sourced, sustainable lifestyle. Ah, we're born of this word. Sustainable. And what is a sustainable investment? So we're going to do a little exercise together. We're going to think. And I'm going to give you three examples. And I want you to think really hard. What is a sustainable investment? First example. Is a solar panel company sustainable? So if you buy the stock of a company that produces solar panels, are you investing sustainably? I would say, yeah. I mean, yeah, solar, emissions free, why not? What if the same solar panel company is using coal for its electricity? So think of the irony. You produce solar panels, but you use coal as your energy to produce those solar panels. And let's take it up a step. Let's go beyond climate. What if you're severely violating labor laws? Does sustainability go beyond the climate, into society, into people? We'll answer this in a second. Next example. Is the world's largest offshore wind energy company sustainable? If I buy stock of this company, am I investing sustainably? I would say, yeah, why not? Wind energy, emissions free, right? But what if the same company is also an oil and gas company? Can it be called sustainable? Last example. A bank what if you're the world's largest lender of green projects? These trillions and trillions of euros that are going into projects, somebody's financing them. Banks play a huge role in the energy transition. So if I buy stock in this bank, is my investment sustainable? Well, what if the same bank is also the largest lender of fossil fuel projects? Can it be considered sustainable? So ladies and gentlemen, this is not theory. These are real life examples. The world is messy. It's not so black and white. So is a solar panel company sustainable? China has 80% of the solar panel market. Four out of every five solar panels in the world are thanks to China. They're an economy that is based a lot on coal energy. So these factories are using a lot of coal. But even worse, journalists have uncovered, and we got journalists here, they've uncovered that a lot of these production centers were actually dis detention centers where they're using forced labor. That's a form of slavery for minorities, a lot of Muslim minorities. So therefore, is this sustainable? I think we would all agree that, you know, if slavery is definitely not sustainable, I think that, that answer is easy. But a solar panel company that uses green energy overall and protects labor rights, yeah, I would say they're sustainable. Second example. The world's largest offshore wind energy is a Danish company called Orsted. Orsted used to be called the Danish Oil and Gas Company. And they've transitioned significantly from oil and gas production to wind energy. So if I had invested in this company five years ago, could I call it a sustainable investment? If I invest today, can it be called sustainable because of their history? I'm a big fan of this company. I think they're doing excellent things for the wind energy market. And they're moving away from oil and gas. They're transitioning away. And lastly, if you're a bank and you're the biggest global lender in green projects, JP Morgan, 
my former home. I was there for 20 years. Love that bank. Love the people there, great friends. A lot of really good human beings there. They finance $42 billion in green projects. $42 billion wouldn't exist without JP Morgan. But they also finance $57 billion of fossil fuel projects. Ah! So can JP Morgan be called sustainable? And where do you draw the line? What's the ratio? Or how do you measure this? Is it if you're above average, are you sustainable? If you're 100% green, are you sustainable? Is it 80-20? I don't know. And why am I telling you all this? Because defining sustainability is hard because it's very subjective a lot of times. There's a lot of values that also come into play. We have different values as human beings, but we also have different values between countries, between continents. Right? But I got good news. The European Union is taking the lead globally. They actually created a definition of sustainable investing. I won't read it all, but basically, yeah, sustainable investing is an investment in an economic activity that contributes to an environmental objective or contributes to a social objective. Provided you follow good governance practices, provided you don't harm any other of the objectives. They took a crack at it. Now, I read this, I'm still confused. Because it's still very subjective. What is an environmental objective? Right? How much green electricity should I be using to be called sustainable? What labor practice? It's, it. But this is great, because this is a start. They're taking a crack at it, and it's being refined. Sustainability, this is something that 10 years we weren't talking about when we talked about investment. So it's all very new. It's in, it's, in, it's in its infancy. And it has growing pains. And some of the growing pains that we have, as regulation is not necessarily consistent globally, data is not available, companies are still trying to figure out how to report a lot of this stuff, local availability of energy, if you're a mid-sized company, you want to use green energy, but your government hasn't provided green energy, is that your fault? You don't have the money to invest in your own energy. So there's a lot of that. It's backward looking. So back to the Danish company example, you know, it was oil and gas. What if we look forward and they change things? And really companies lack sustainability experts because it's a new field. We're learning a lot of this as we go. We're changing it in real time. But I have really good news for you. There's a thing called the Paris Agreement that was agreed in 2015 by 200 countries. It's the most ambitious, the most global, the most impactful climate treaty we have. And these countries agreed, first of all, okay, Global warming is a problem. They agreed to it. Imagine getting 200 countries to agree on anything. They agreed to it. And they agreed that, okay, it's being caused by fossil fuels. Great. So what are we going to do about it? What's the goal? They agreed. The goal is to get emissions down to net zero by the middle of this century. And if we do that, we control global warming. If we do that, the temperature of the planet rises only between one and a half to two degrees. Remember that number, one and a half to two degrees. That's the goal. It's too late for the temperature not to increase at all. We're way past that. But one and a half to two, we save the planet from the worst of the global warming catastrophe. Now, to give you some examples of the Paris Agreement, this is a framework. It's a framework that then waterfalls down to companies, to consumers, to laws, to markets. It incentivizes different behaviors. So example, here in Europe, by 2035, 
all new cars need to be electric. By 2030, all plastic needs to be 100% reusable or recyclable. That affects how businesses behave. That affects how consumers will behave. That affects supply chains, right? In the US as well, there was a huge infrastructure plan that is incentivizing, giving tax credits, giving low-cost loans for green investments. The government created a fund that invests in projects to help with the green transition. So this is all happening. It's happening. And when it comes down to investors, the EU or the European Commission created something really cool that are funds or ETFs that can be called Paris Aligned. And Paris Aligned, by giving the rules, if you win a fund that you call yourself Paris Aligned, your overall fund needs to have 50% less carbon intensity than the stock market that you're comparing yourself against. And you need to be reducing your carbon by 7% a year. So this thing exists. And what's even cool about this is that these funds, they also take into account the social aspect where they exclude companies in violations of UN and OECD principles, which slavery, guess what, is one of them. Now, when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to the Paris Agreement, all industries need to be part of this, right? It's, it's, it's very easy to think solar panels, wind energy, electric vehicles, but what about the others? Tech. Tech is a sector with huge emissions. Most people won't associate that. They consume so much electricity. They have factories. Samsung has as many emissions as the country of Norway. That's one tech company across its entire value chain. One company. So imagine the impact if companies start or are already aligned to these Paris goals. The impact is huge. Right? Pharmaceuticals, they have a lot of waste that they need to deal with. So they, they're contributing. Banks, as I mentioned, can they lend more to the green transition? You know, cosmetics company, luxury goods, food companies, how are they sourcing their raw materials? How are they working with their suppliers, with their farmers? Are they ensuring that their supply chain is also aligned with the Paris Agreement? So this applies to all. And to put it more concretely in examples, and this is not perfect, this is far from perfect, but it's a start. You have the S&P 500, right? Everybody knows that index, the most famous one. Fun fact, it actually has 503 companies. But then the creator of the S&P 500, Standard & Poor's, created an S&P 500 Paris Aligned Index. And it's a subset of the 300 companies that are generally most aligned to Paris. And when you look at the implied temperature rise at which they're operating, uh, in other way, are they aligned to Paris or not with that one and a half to, to two degrees that I mentioned? The S&P 500 as a whole is not, at least not today. The S&P Paris aligned is. And that's because they have 61% less carbon intensity. They exclude the oil and gas sector. So this exists today. You have ETFs that are Paris aligned. And, and there's a really cool website, you know, to make this actionable. Um, by MSCI, a third-party data provider. They did this for free. Normally, you got to pay for this stuff. They actually show it for free, where you can, if you're looking at investing in a fund or you own a fund, you can actually go into that link and see what is the implied temperature rise of all the companies inside that fund. So as you can see, the S&P, 2 to 3.2. The S&P Paris Align ETF is in line with 1.5 to 2 degrees. So this is super cool. Companies, you can also look at companies in this MSCI website. So I chose ExxonMobil just because they're the biggest oil company outside Saudi Arabia. 
And of course, the way they're operating is their implied temperature is 3.2. They're very misaligned with Paris. But then Microsoft, a tech company, what? A tech company? Well, they're the biggest holding in the Paris aligned index. They're operating at a temperature rise that is better than the Paris Agreement. And how are they doing this? Well, Microsoft is one of the biggest buyers of electricity in the world. They're huge. And they are really focused on making sure that their electricity is green. In their own operations, though, they reduced their emissions by 23% last year, Microsoft. 23%, huge achievement. But they have a supply chain. And they're struggling with the supply chain because those emissions aren't going down. But they're working with their suppliers to make it happen. So Microsoft has a goal that by 2025, they're going to be net zero in their emissions. And by 2030, their entire value chain will be at zero as well. And so they, look, they work with local governments where their suppliers are, and they help build solar panel energy, wind energy. And then if you're going to build it for all the suppliers and the factories that they have, we might as well give it out to the communities nearby, to all the houses, to all the other businesses around the area. So they're doing a lot of good things. And of course, nothing is perfect. No one is that zero today. It's a transition. It's a transition. Do we have credible plans to get there? And a lot of companies do. And the best part is that you know, there's this myth that sustainable investing like, is bad for returns. Well, if you look at those 300 companies that are most Paris aligned versus the 500 companies of the entire index, the Paris aligned companies are winning. They've been winning since 2016 when the agreement went into force. So we've got to kill this myth that sustainable investing doesn't work. Being Paris aligned is system. And you can still generate financial returns. Now, sustainable investing has, has gathered a lot of momentum in the past five years. It's essentially grown by five times. And even last year, that was a very difficult year in markets. Every quarter, you had more money buying than actually selling. So funds had positive flows, unlike the rest of the stock market. And investors are noticing, and things are happening. You're going to hear something. You heard it here first, if you haven't heard it. The famous pies, the principal adverse impacts. This is going to be something really big come 2024, 2025, and, and forward. Which fund managers are going to have to show their investors the impacts a financial product may have on sustainability matters from detailed emissions, to biodiversity, to renewable electricity use, to things in human rights, etc., etc. And more companies are being forced to report this as we move along, and they're getting really good at it. We're still not there yet. The, the information is, is, is still lacking a lot, but it's a process. It's a process. And here, I, I, I apologize because I need to get salesy for a couple of minutes. At Grunfing, this is exactly what we do. This is all we do. We manage money and we look for sustainable funds that are Paris aligned. We help you. If you don't have the time to do all the research, if you don't want to deal with all the buying and selling, we help you do that. That's all we do. So there's something actionable that you can take away from here. We invest in ETFs for the climate portfolios that are Paris aligned. But sustainability goes beyond the climate as well. So we offer gender equality things. Our founders are very passionate. Trin Herdman, first employee at Weiss, great businesswoman. Very passionate about this subject. Come say hello after the, after the call. Um, healthcare as well is another theme. 
I what our company is doing when it comes to epilepsy, cancers, Alzheimer's, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what's really cool is that we don't stop at investing, but we like to engage with the major corporations. Because we know that to truly create an impact globally, it's the big ones that really have to change. And then that cascades down to consumers, to suppliers, to the small businesses. So all these companies on this list, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle, BNP Paribas, BASF, chemicals, banks, food manufacturers, we've met with them. We've met with their senior management. And we talk to them. And we try to tell them what investors are thinking from the sustainability side. And we try to influence their sustainability behavior. And you may ask yourself, well, how the heck does Groomfield get meetings with all these companies? Well, I will tell you. We're part of a coalition with a charity based in the UK called Share Action. And so we go to this charity and we say, hey, we Groomfield, we have X amount of euros under management. And then another pension fund will come and say, hey, we have X amount of euros. And another asset manager, we have Z amount of euros. And as a group, we become really big in the billions and billions and billions in assets under management. So as a group, we go and knock on the doors of these companies. And guess what? These companies want to listen. They want to hear what investors are thinking. They want you to buy their stock. If sustainable funds Start buying their stock. That's good for their stock price. And these companies, generally speaking, I mean, it's, they're human beings at these companies. They're people who have goals, ambitions. They want to feed their families. They're our friends. <laughs> like, generally, these people want to do good things. They have sustainability departments that do want to make change. They struggle mainly because these companies are so big they're just stuck in bureaucracy. They're stuck in inertia. They don't know who needs to make the big decision. They may not have the experts on the field. They may have other priorities that they haven't focused on yet. I'll give you an example. BNP Paribas, the largest bank in the EU. We've been talking to them. We met with them. These are meetings of 10 to 20 people. Not that many. And BNP, and you can look this up, they recently published that they're going to stop financing all new oil and gas projects. And they're going to significantly increase their green financing. This is super cool. And this was the, cause, the, the result of this engagement. So we do that. So we ensure that every euro you have with Grunfin, we're giving you a voice in these meetings. Then, um, last thing, if this is a subject you're really passionate about, um, if you want to start with the basics, there's a phenomenal book called How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. I get no royalties from telling you this, trust me. I just found it to be amazing in terms of how it explains the basics. And then if you really want to get into the details, Speed and Scale by John Doerr, phenomenal book. It creates an action plan on how to get us to net zero by 2050. In detail. Phenomenal, phenomenal book. So to conclude, the name of this presentation was Investment Strategies That Save the Planet. The Paris Agreement is what saves the planet. We have it. The most ambitious global impactful treaty we have. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. <clears throat> Try getting 200 countries to agree on something to make it perfect. But it's really good. It's not perfect, but it's really good. And the wheels are moving. And we've got to get away from the mindset that either you're 100% sustainable today or you're garbage. No one is 100% sustainable today. It's a transition. It's a journey. Do we have credible plans to get to that transition of zero? So when you invest, if this is something that you care about, then yeah, you know, make sure your companies you buy are aligned to Paris. 
Read their sustainability reports. They're kind of fun. I like them. You know, what are they doing? Are the funds aligned to Paris? If it's not public companies that you're buying in the stock market, you can always look at projects and see if they have the spirit of the Paris Agreement. But remember, it's a journey. So let's get started. Aita. Thank you. In a second, we will take some questions from the audience and share some books with the audience. So raise your hand and the microrunners can see you. But uh, I would like to start as we have Alejandro here. Uh, and I know you are former head of division in JP Morgan in New York and you manage big portfolio there, I think 30 million and more. Can you give some uh, tips for the retail investors, the retail investors from that journey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I um, mean, it, it was a lot of the focus. Um, if if you happen to be at the, the investor Thomas conference in January, um, I gave a lot of tips. If you haven't, well, here they go. I, I would say the the most important, or not the most important, but but several of the important ones um, from that journey that I saw is that trying to time the market, trying to time perfectly when you sell, when you buy, when you sell, when you buy. Impossible. I worked with the biggest hedge funds in the world. I saw the biggest asset managers in the world. Our own JP Morgan portfolio managers. We couldn't get it right. Timing the market is really, really hard. So I'm of the mindset, just invest long term. Yeah, you can have some money, play with it, do some trading, but, but have a core part that's just long term. And you know, every month when you get your salary, save up a part of it and invest it, and invest it, and invest it. And over time, the market has gone up. U.S. market has been going up 7% annually for 125 years. So that's one of the tips. Thank you. So uh, yeah, it was understood it's easy to invest and reduce the karma via green fund ETFs. Uh, so, but if I want to start alone, this. Uh, sustainable investment journey. So how, how to really analyze, can you give some just for the beginners three steps, how to really analyze the spirit of climate agreement? Yeah, well, it depends on what type of investment you're, you're trying to do. If it's a fund, maybe you can start with that MSCI link that I, that I sent and just get a sense of what the implied temperature rise is of, of the fund. Um, and look at the main holdings. Um, again, it, Maybe some people like to read the sustainability reports. I do. I think that they're very revealing. Um, but to make it really easy, it's just funds that are Paris aligned by, by the good asset management houses. I think you'll generally be okay. Um, and, and, and really, if you're investing in single projects um, uh, or even companies individually, just uh, Make sure or ask yourself if that's in spirit with, with the Paris Agreement goal. Like, what are they doing? Do they have a credible plan? Can they really make it happen? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Questions? So, where is the mic? Hi. And maybe we have a presentation. Uh, what's your uh, view on uh, nuclear energy, including the proposed new uh, small modular adapters? Uh, as it wasn't uh, yeah. covered. Thank you. Yeah, so um, a very personal opinion, um, but I am in favor of nuclear energy because nuclear energy is uh, carbon free and uh, it can operate 24 7 regardless of wind and sun conditions. And uh, you know, there was a great quote in one of those books, Bill Gates said that, that he's in favor of nuclear because like a plane, when we have an accident in the plane and a plane crashes, it's horrible. But we don't ban flying. We figure out what went wrong and make it better. And that's, what's ha that's what we're doing with, with nuclear. And uh, you know, aside Chernobyl, um, in, in terms of like major deaths and crimes, like there hasn't been anything huge. There was of course in, in, in Japan, the, the tsunami, but um, really, that was just such an extraordinary event. But aside these two, in the past 40 years, you don't have any major destruction. So I think if, if the goal is to get to, to net zero, nuclear plays an important uh, role in this. But we got to ensure it's, it's safe. We got to ensure 
Um, we, we handle the toxic waste properly, etc. But yes, I am, I am in favor. Well, the thing is, since, since nuclear wasn't classified as green until like three months ago, so the, the EU changed the law and they, and they added nuclear as part of the green, a lot of the funds that we hold don't really hold much exposure to nuclear, um, but if they wanted to, they could. Yeah. Okay, some more quick questions. So, very is the mic? So, uh, as I understand, we have just one mic at the moment, so... Thank you. Uh, Alejandro, I just have a question about uh, who is the client of Greenfin? And why I'm asking this, uh, this is because uh, uh, I want you to say to us that it's a myth that only young people are interested in, uh, in sustainable investing. Well, I, I would say it to you because I'm, I'm not young. I'm, I'm, I'm middle-aged and I'm interested in sustainable investing. <laughs> so um, I, I, I do think it's, it's, it's a myth. Um, I think, you know, from, from the growth that you've seen in sustainable investing over the past, you know, five years, the five times growth, it's not just young people, right? I mean, you can't have those, that, that amount of money coming in just from, from students. Um, and so in, in Grunfin, really, our, our client base are individuals. Um, we have individuals of all ages, all backgrounds, all professions, all knowledge levels. And we also um, work with companies. And by companies, I mean operating companies that want to offer a Bloomfield portfolio as part of their employee benefits program. So it's you know, companies that want to get incentivized people to save because save is so, saving money is so important for the well-being over the long term and savings can really accumulate. So employers are offering Bloomfield as part, in addition to the salary, to say, Let's get you invested in and, and help you. And it's, we work with HR departments, all ages. So, so no, it's not just young people. That's, that's the majority. The, the majority, to, yeah, probably up to, I got that Vicky, she does all the analysis, falls sort of like in the 35 year area, right? 25 to 45. To 45, 25 yeah. to 45, the majority. Thank you, Vicky. And one final question. Uh, Okay, there. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I can see you are very passionate about it. And uh, my question is, how sustainable are you yourself in your daily life? Let's say buying uh, clothes, for example, or food. To how much you take your time to go deeply into, let's say, the companies you buy clothes from. Thank you. Yeah, so e excellent question. And, uh, you know, as, as I said, I have no moral authority, and I, I'm far from, from that. And uh, I love my excellent hamburgers and things like that. So I'm, I'm, um, I definitely have a lot more work to do. Um, and clothes, I, don't, I buy clothes like once every five years, just because I'm cheap. Really, I mean, so so I don't do much research into where my clothes are coming from because I, I don't have that much that much of it. Um, but uh, but yeah, in terms of like, I do I have done things that I'm that I'm happy about, like um, in, in in my home. Believe it or not, when when I first purchased it, it was a house from 2005. It it was the heating was run on diesel, so the house actually had diesel tanks. So I made quite an important investment into converting that into a heat pump that captures um, air, converts it to water, and heats the house. So that has been said by the EU that it's the most efficient um, green um, mechanism to heat in your homes. Um, and I invest in, in green startups. Um, there's a really cool one that is looking to replace plastic uh, bubble wrap with the leftover sheep wool. So I think that they're trying to do great things. Um, uh, recycle, compost, um, and things like that. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, again, no moral judgment here. I have a long way to go, as I think we all do. It's a process. It's a transition. Let's get there by 2050. Thank you so much, Alejandro Jimenez. <laughs>